This conference will now be this yes. conference will now be recorded. Cool, let me just talk it. Let me make you full screen. Just give me one second. Just have to make sure the live stream is uh, up and running. Yeah. Okay, so I'm no longer seeing your screen. Uh oh. So yeah, give me one second. Okay, seeing your screen now. Okay, good. Perfect. And everything is recorded. Let me just uh, reach out to my guy who is doing my live stream, make sure everything is working from his end. Okay. So I can check it out. Okay. So is everything, by the way? Not too bad. It's been uh, obviously a little crazy, as you can, as I'm sure you guys <laughs> are are hearing more than enough of, and and hopefully things are. Uh, not uh not as crazy for you but i'm sure there's a lot of impact to uh yeah. you know restrictions <laughs> on travel and everything else i'm sure it's just a whole it's a whole different world for all of us yep just give me one second michael hey Nyron. you ready right? okay so um I, my screen i still see in the, the sponsor the sponsor screen from what we have the general screen but we ready for whenever you're ready to go across the night stream Yeah, COVID. Yeah, cool, perfect. All right, cool. Bye. All right, Michael. Uh, I'm just waiting for the live stream to switch across. You should be fine. Okay. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have Mr. Michael Sharon, who is a ASHRAE member, and he is the chair of the Ventilation for Heating and Healthcare Facilities. Uh, he has agreed to participate and do an online session for us um, on the guidance for COVID-19, also known as the novel coronavirus that um, we've been seeing coming across in uh, Trinidad right now. And it's been hitting us for some success because it started off as one case and now we're going to uh, seven cases as of last night. So Michael is actually going to do a short presentation for us today and he's going to build on it in our um, presentation that we're having starting from next week uh on friday on the coronavirus and indoor air quality so i'll pass all across to michael great thank you so much um thank you uh also for uh setting this up uh and and even for setting it up earlier than we had uh, initially planned i felt like uh, as much as anything else it's it is important to get this information out there um, for those folks who are either work at work near work with um, facilities that are impacted by this uh, especially as fo folks that you know that places that treat patients or potential patients um you know it's it's very important to take the opportunity now as much as possible to to get prepped and uh and make as as much readiness uh for uh, whether it's one patient or many more than one patient uh the more that we're prepared the, the better we can all be and so that's the intent behind uh what we're going to try and run through um here today so uh uh, I am the CEO of an engineering firm um, here in Orlando and, and uh, 
that has offices all over the U.S., but uh, I, I am, as uh, they said, the chair of ASHRAE Standard 170, which is the ventilation for healthcare facilities. Uh, for some reason, my slides are not advancing. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, here we go. All right. Uh, as uh, just as a quick disclaimer, these are my opinions. They're they're not ASHRAE or ASHI's opinions. However, uh, a lot of the input uh, that has gone into the development of of these slides uh, is the result of working with ASHI, working with our 170 committee, uh, and also the ASHRAE Technical Committee for Healthcare 9.6. Uh, and so, uh, you know, very much um, uh, I would acknowledge the input of uh, a variety of folks into what the, these slides have in it, um, including folks at ASHI and ASHRAE, uh, and also some of uh, my teammates uh, at TLC. So I'm going to cover this with uh, a little bit of um, the general perspective of things. Uh, I'm assuming that to some extent you're you're all familiar with some of the basics about what the virus is and so forth. But but I'm going to still cover some of it just because uh, there's some aspects that I think are important to cover, uh, and then a little bit of uh, uh, a realization of well, what is an action plan? And then how would you implement it? And then some other important factors that we're seeing uh, a variety as as we're assisting uh, a lot of facilities in preparation. So, uh, you know, without question, the intent is to try and uh, get a, as head of, ahead of this as we can, and and that's uh, really the the point of having a conversation today as opposed to having a conversation a week from now. Uh, and why is that? Um, you know, um, you know, it's because once it starts, uh, what you and we have um, experienced, and and unfortunately will continue to experience, is that uh, you know one person uh, impacts or spreads the contagion to one to two other people on average, and. Uh, it, when they're undiagnosed in some cases. So, um, you know, this is what happens is, uh, as we get into a level of community spread beyond just um, travel-related cases, um, as is the case especially with places like Italy and, and so forth. Uh, it, uh, in the U.S., we have a lot of um, critique around what, it, what are tested cases versus untested cases, you know, um, in other words, how many are actual known uh, versus unknown? And uh, there was an excellent article that uh, I will share the um, reference to uh, uh, with the folks. But uh, one of the most interesting things that they provided is the two ways to estimate the true number of cases. So if uh, you know if you have three reported cases uh, in Trinidad today, the possibility exists or the likelihood exists that you have between 30 and 60 actual uh, cases that just happen to not have been tested, not have been diagnosed, or may not even be symptomatic today, but are walking around and, and may be spreading um, uh, the virus unwittingly. Uh, on uh, Or in the case of places where, uh, where deaths have unfortunately already occurred, uh, the other way to estimate it, the number of true cases in an area is the number of deaths multiplied by 400. And if you took the present statistics, even in the U.S., um, those numbers actually, those two numbers are fairly, uh, fairly close. And the only uh, anomalous condition is uh, in Seattle, Washington area, um, there was a nursing home where it spread through the nursing home population and and older populations are uh, unfortunately very susceptible um, from a, a mortality standpoint and um, and so um, that had affected maybe the the number of deaths uh, versus the the uh, the other number a little bit for for us statistically 
uh, the way uh, the COVID-19 spreads, it's viable on surfaces for two to three days. That is certainly the most common uh, means of transmission. So door handles, counters, those things. Um, that's why hand washing is uh, imperative. That's why disinfecting counters and, and other high touch surfaces door handles and and door push you know door breaker bars and and all those things um, it's also viable as uh, you know in the air for at least three hours and so that's where it's going to be important also for for us to manage and do what we can as Asher members and people who um, manage control and and can do something about the air side of things. Um, we're going to rely upon uh, maybe others to, to deal with surfaces, but we can definitely do our part in managing it if it and when it's in the air. Uh, the transmission rates have generally been proven to be similar to influenza. Obviously, uh, you know, the matter that the, the asymptomatic cases uh, load is a little higher. Uh, there's other implications with that that I'll share in a moment. Uh, from a standpoint of when folks are most contagious is when they're also the sickest, when, which is likely to be uh, when they are in a hospital. And that's when uh, we would express that it's important for us to help identify what are the best environmental controls uh, and mechanisms of HVAC management in order to reduce that uh, contaminant load in a space. And that's going to be important uh, for the protection of healthcare workers, uh, potentially visitors, if visitors are even allowed into a facility, uh, and then also other patients. Uh, it's important to remember uh, very much so that uh, at-risk populations become severe cases, and um, this has shown to require oxygen interventions, meaning uh, respiratory therapy, uh, and um, so there's some infrastructure-related issues to think about in regards to that. Uh, the mortality rate is higher. It is 30 times higher than influenza. That's why uh, there is a much greater level of um, awareness at this point and also uh, a, a greater urgency to call to action about it. Uh, and the mortality rate is, is certainly highest for the 80-year-olds and up. Uh, and is also higher for 70-year-olds and 70 to 79 and 60 to 69 uh, in comparison to, uh, to an influenza case. Uh, nursing homes, as I'm just starting to describe a little bit, nursing homes and assisted living facilities, uh, those folks that generally are care, you know, those facilities that are generally caring for folks uh, um, in that age bracket and sometimes with other uh, what they call, you know, comorbidity factors, whether it's, you know, hypertension or cardiac uh, issues or respiratory issues to begin with, they're at very high risk. Um, doing what you can to protect those facilities, keeping folks out of those facilities um, in regards to visitors, even recognizing the risk that staff bring in by just showing up for a shift is uh, very important to realize. Uh, one of the, uh, a bit of recent information that has come out of uh, testing is South Korea has done a, a fair, very effective job of testing anybody who is questioned or questionable because they may have been exposed to others. And one of the things that had significantly, they had had found uh, and we wanted to make sure to highlight and recognize is they had a, a very high number of folks that were uh, young who 
really did not show symptoms, but in reality had and uh, ultimately spread the virus uh, beyond themselves. And um, so, you know, it's important to realize that this may be a uh, vector for how this virus uh, can uh, propagate itself is by young folks who are generally unaffected or minimally affected, may not even realize, and, and depending upon where you are and the availability of testing, which in the U.S. even today is not sig significant, even though um, it's being talked about of rolling out uh, availability of testing, um, it hasn't been realized everywhere that the potential is that people who may be non-symptomatic uh, are walking around and in doing so um, may be unwittingly spreading um, the virus and, and unfortunately uh, potentially by interacting with, uh, with folks that are more uh, susceptible or would become more uh, severe cases uh, in, in catching the virus themselves. Uh, it, this is normal flu season, uh, so a lot of hospitals are already running at, at somewhat higher capacity uh, because of, uh, you know, just conditions. So without having a strategy, patient needs may not be met. So it's important to develop some strategies, and we would certainly advocate for you recognizing that, uh, that there should be some strategies um, set up. Uh, most hospitals have a fairly small number of airborne infectious isolation rooms, uh, and those uh, can't just, you know, although they may normally be used for suspected COVID patients, uh, they also have other purposes, whether it's for TB or, or, or other uh, infectious diseases that, that you may, that may need to be dealt with also. Uh, within a hospital. So uh, it's important to realize as numbers increase, you may not have as many in airborne infectious isolation rooms as you would need. Uh, and so that's where uh, this preparation and some of the strategies that we'll talk through uh, would be worthwhile to, to employ. Uh, it's important also to recognize that uh, as the suspected case numbers increase, which uh, which may happen, that if you commit an AII room today, uh, a patient may be in there for two weeks or more, and you would want to practice a policy where someone you put someone in a room, you don't want to move them around. You want to leave them in a room and treat them in that one space. Uh, but if you do that with your AII rooms today, uh, then that means that room is no longer available in the future under that premise. Um, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, the United States Authority on, on this is recommending that those AII rooms be used only for uh, confirmed COVID patients that are under, undergoing aerosol generating procedures uh, rather than just the patients under normal circumstances. And, and the reason for that is because of that future flexibility. Uh, and that's a, that's a tough thing to say because that's, uh, that's also saying, well, where are those patients gonna go? And we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Uh, you know, there's some description on the bottom there as to what are aerosol generating procedures. And I'm not a clinician, so I won't even go into that. Uh, what the CDC has uh, recently uh, expressed is that facilities could consider designated, designating entire units, uh, whether that's a part of a patient floor or a patient floor or an area, dedicated area that happened to have a number of beds or the right infrastructure to support uh, multiple patients uh, in a space or area. Uh, and then also with that would be the benefit, hopefully, of dedicating specific healthcare personnel uh, 
uh, and that is twofold. One is it limits uh, exposure risk of those healthcare workers uh, just interacting with those patients, so they're practicing the right protocols for their own protection, and then also because they're not intermingling with other patients, it reduces the risk of them potentially carrying that uh, virus as they interact with patients that are not COVID uh, positive patients uh, and so avoids other issues. Um, also, it uh, it creates uh, hopefully a cohort of, of staff that are only treating those patients so that if, uh, if it were to ever happen that a, a healthcare worker got sick, uh, they uh, could be replaced with a, another uh, healthcare worker and, um, you know, and, and you could move on without uh, as much the intermingling of healthcare worker teams uh, where the possibility could be that multiple healthcare workers um, um, fell out of rotation because of being ill themselves. Uh, we, uh, although this is not CDC guidance, um, we have it on good authority from, from others that are in the infection control practice that you keep uh, folks that are suspected uh, in one area, keep folks that are confirmed in another area. Don't in, intermingle the, the two because the possibility, unfortunately, can be that, that one could end up um, uh, pass, converting the, the virus to the other. Um, and so in, until you're testing, until testing is up to snuff, you really want to um, try and minimize mixing the two as much as possible. And I realize that that may or may not be easy to do. Uh, we are dealing with a number of uh, healthcare facilities today that are already restricting access to their emergency department. And that comes in a couple different forms. Uh, and we'll describe a little bit of that, but uh, suffice to say that uh, it's important to recognize that uh, your e emergency department could become overwhelmed and uh, with people either because they think they do or they definitely do. And the only way to um, not have the lobby or the waiting area of the emergency department completely jammed up is by uh, pushing that and triaging those people before they come into the facility. Uh, what a number of facilities have done is if people present, meaning they show up at the hospital, um, you can triage them. If they are healthy enough to, meaning they're not ambulatory, they're healthy enough to uh, show up and they're healthy enough that you could swab them, send that swab for testing, and then send them, send them directly home to, to self-care at home then that is going to be better because if they're just waiting around for a test result that may take a day or two days or however long it takes uh, but they can care for themselves you don't want them in the hospital at all uh, one because they may be carrying it and then two because they may not and now they pick it up and uh and stuff and then we've already talked about uh nursing homes and assisted living facilities uh we would uh, recommend that uh, that you encourage the folks, whether it's because you have a family member in a facility or you know the management of the facility. Uh, a lot of facilities are going to arrangements where uh, they check staff for uh, before every shift uh, for flu-like conditions. They check their temperature. Um, they'll ask them a couple questions. Um, and then any visitor, if you even allow visitors into a facility, uh, maybe you do the same and then also confirm their travel history. Uh, you know, that has become a requirement in Florida. Florida is, we have a lot of old people, so it's going to be, um, we're, we're, we have our fingers crossed. Uh, so what is an action plan? Uh, certainly reach out to um, the hospitals and, and senior living uh, facilities that you know that you deal with on an ongoing basis perhaps uh, and be supportive 
um, share the knowledge that you have, the, share your expertise in, in what you know and understand, um, answer questions beyond call, uh, and ultimately, uh, preparation is positivity. That's the most that, in, in many instances, that we um, can do on our side, um, you know, uh, other than caring for people ourselves, which is not our expertise. Uh, so a couple of things in regards to what would uh, be important from an action plan standpoint. Uh, one is uh, verify the performance of, exist of your existing infection control room, infectious isolation rooms now. Uh, and then the same goes to the HVAC systems the, in any critical area, certainly the emergency department, uh, certainly also the ICU. Uh, we would encourage that facilities secure their HEPA units. The, the portable HEPA units uh, is primarily what we're speaking of because those units are going to be very important for, uh, for some of the strategies that they may employ uh, in, in their facilities as surge uh, issues arise. Um, and then also um, in, in, in uh, reaching out and if there are HEPA units uh, elsewhere, uh, you know, around that are available to make sure that they uh, are requested and um, and and get to uh, uh, be able to be used and deployed in a, a hospital. Uh, the developing a surge and patient segregation plan and and already having that plan going. You know, don't wait. Don't. Uh, uh, study it or wait for more studies or anything along those lines, get it set up, lay it out, work with the clinicians and, and the other authorities within the hospital system as needed, but um, don't wait. Uh, and then ultimately also making sure that your power uh, availability and power reliability is in place, uh, which usually also means uh, putting any equipment that you're deploying on critical or equipment branch power, emergency power systems. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's the, the matter of, of what you're going to be able to do and uh, what you, systems are available to allow you to do are what they are. Uh, accept that fact. Uh, except that, you know, our expertise uh, with regard to the HVAC system is just one small part of a much bigger undertaking uh, or or endeavor, and that's okay. But let's do our part, and uh, whether it's a true isolation configuration that you can accomplish, or simply a modified alternative arrangement. Uh, it is what it is, uh, and it's each installation is somewhat going to be custom to the circumstances that uh, are available at the facility. A couple basic parameters. Uh, we want to do no harm. We want to understand that what we're doing is only going to make the situation better as best as possible, uh, and that it's going to help better protect workers, help protect other patients, uh, where possible as well. Uh, we're going to want to always consider and ensure that airflow goes from a clean environment or a cleaner environment to a less clean environment uh, as, uh, as, we alter, as, as we alter anything. Uh, and then as a reminder again, don't house suspected patients with confirmed patients. So we're going to take three different approaches, if you will, to this. Uh, one is going to be, you know, what your standard operating procedure would normally be, which is that uh, from a best practice standpoint, you're going to put uh, COVID-19 confirmed patients in an airborne infectious isolation room because you have them, because you can. Uh, but you're also going to create additional dedicated or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, additional dedicated airborne infectious isolation rooms or temporary 
segregation rooms that uh, that have HEPA filtration and negative pressure and the right and increased air changes, which typically a portable HEPA unit will enable greater air changes. Uh, and then in those facilities where it's warranted and where it's appropriate and where you're going to deal with uh, higher populations in the area and and thus uh, might be might need to anticipate the possibility of having to deal with more a, a larger scale surge you're going to establish today dedicated wards or suites in order to address that and work out both the environmental side and then also work out the clinical side with in, in coordination with the clinical team uh, just as I said before, uh, you know, this isn't going to be perfect, but it's going to be what it is. Um, and uh, temporary surge uh, segregation areas are not going to be true airborne infectious isolation rooms, and that's okay. Um, it is going to still provide uh, a level of protection that in, is intended to be greater than just uh, the use of a standard patient room. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, many COVID patients uh, may ultimately, as they become severe, will require intensive care treatments. And uh, commonly, both from a staffing perspective and from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, intensive care treatment requires going into an intensive care room um, many, uh, it was very common in past practice that intensive care rooms were positively pressurized. Uh, you need to evaluate uh, if you're going to be putting patients in an ICU environment, which is very possible. Um, how is your intensive care unit and, and those rooms arranged today if they are positively pressured today? then you probably want to proactively go and figure out how to do something about that uh, and recognize that as you maybe change the, just simply changing the air balance of that area that you need to um, do some things and recognize differences that might happen because of that. Um, we would certainly uh, recommend that you closely evaluate the potential of changing it to a once through air approach and we'll talk about that a little bit later as to what elements may um, need to happen in order to do that we also know that and and would uh, warn you that uh, you know changing the outside air amount uh, you know as as many of you can do the math very readily from a, a load standpoint changes uh, the humidity management issues in a building and also uh, obviously how you address that from a building pressure control standpoint. Uh, this slide, uh, you know, we'll share the slide deck with you and, and this is actually updated a little bit from uh, the earlier version that, that I've shared with your team, but, and I'll share this version with you, but uh, recognize that there's no one answer uh, because of the different systems that may exist in or in, in a patient room today, the uh, the there may be a different answer uh, as to how best to uh, solve the problem, if you will, of creating an AII type room in the environment and the sy system setup that you have. And so this is just some examples. Uh, you know the. Uh, option one is that you have a room already and you use that room. Option two is you take a HEPA system and you discharge it to the outside. Um, and we'll talk, talk through a couple of these in more specifics um, down below, uh, but just want to walk through them. Uh, the, um, you know, option three is uh, similar, uh, but just using a fan and not, not a HEPA unit. Uh, option four is taking a HEPA unit and discharging it to the return. Uh, option five is, is discharging it to the carter. So you're still creating uh, negative pressure 
in and the air change rates in the room itself. Uh, and then six is just circulating it within the space itself, and that's it. Um, and using some other means to to make the room somewhat negative. Uh, a couple important items to consider. Uh, standard patient rooms may not have door closers, uh, so you may want to uh, add door closers as a temporary measure. Uh, you also may, uh, you want to have some ability to ensure that rooms are negative relative pressure to the corridor. Uh, as you're doing some of these arrangements, all, most all of these arrangements, so how would you do that? Whether that's a, a actual pressure monitor, whether that's just a ball and tube, or whether that's uh, some toilet paper taped to the near the bottom of the door, so that there's a visual means, simple, basic, and uh, just as effective as anything else. Uh, we've talked about limiting patient transfers. That means once a patient's in a room, you try not to move them around at all. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, or, or finally, uh, recognize that after a patient is removed from a room and the room is being terminally cleaned, there needs to be time for that, the air system in that room to circulate enough to reduce and diminish, dilute the contaminant level that was in that space because a patient was in that space. So there, that time we will, talk about in a moment, but um, there's a CDC slide that uh, is that many people are familiar with. We would only remind you of, of the time factor that should be treated seriously before you let environmental care workers come in, clean a space, uh, terminal clean a space. Uh, you know, you want those workers who are doing, you know, environmental services, the janitor type people, if you want to call it that, uh, those people need to be healthy to do their job just as well as anybody else. So treat that seriously. Uh, so here's just a little more elaboration about um, certain of these options. So, uh, and these remember are all room level examples. And the reason they're room level examples is because uh, you're not going to, you may not have a uh, you know, uh, 30 HEPA units that you can take over a floor and do this on every, on every room on a floor. And quite frankly, if you did this on every room on a floor, when you're sealing the return grill and just pushing supplier in uh, to all, all, you know, every room on a patient floor, that would be problematic because you have no return air going back to your air handler. Um, so this is a strategy that you want to employ uh, for a handful of rooms on an on an out uh, I'm sorry on an air handling system and uh, treat it as such by maybe dedicating you know three rooms on each side of a corridor at the end of a hallway and uh, and and doing something in one area but recognize that there can be an impact on your air handling system's total air balance. So you need to look at what that is. You need to do a little math, a little bit of uh, psychometrics perhaps, uh, and, uh, and, and keep all of those things in mind. The, uh, so uh, with this particular one, uh, you're doing something to retrofit and being able to discharge your HEPA unit uh, which is uh, located here to the to the window uh, or whatever opening you may have uh, to the exterior available to you. And in doing so, this room will become negative uh, because you'll balance this HEPA unit to uh, a little bit more exhaust than the supply coming into the space. And then um, you're getting your air changes or some amount of air changes and also pulling that uh, exhaust out and making the room negative. Uh, the same would go to uh, if you were discharging to the return and the same 
uh, importance to what the impact of the air handling system is. This being a little different because what happens is your HEPA will be balanced to make the room negative, which means in reality, there's an increase of the, re you're forcing an increase of the return air amount into that return system, which means that probably the rooms down the hallway may become slightly positive because they aren't uh, needing uh, to return as much air. That may be okay, but you need to evaluate that closely as to what that impact is. Uh, and then uh, this is a different styled version of HEPA to the corridor. So the same thing, you're sealing off the return grill, you're still supplying air into the space. The difference is you're maybe using visqueen plastic, uh, barrier, creating a temporary plastic barrier in the corridor. And in doing so, uh, the noise of the HEPA unit is no longer in the actual patient room. The patient door would need to stay open. That's an important uh, item. Uh, and so hopefully that is not a fire rated door because that would become an interim life safety issue that you'd have to uh, address in some way. Uh, but this would still ensure that the space, the overall space here is negative uh, because this unit would be balanced. The HEPA unit would still be balanced to uh, a slight amount uh, more in exhaust than the supplier going into a space. And uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide for a second and jump back to it. Uh, you know, we, we realize there's a lot of facilities, uh, especially uh, both older facilities and also uh, facilities where uh, from a sustainability standpoint even, um, they use fan call units uh, for the patient rooms. And, uh, you know, the, it's, uh, I think it's important to realize the challenge that uh, that kind of arrangement can have uh, because, you know, the reality is you're, if you, if you are using and recirculating air in a space, you are likely going to create some contaminant load in the equipment that's recirculating equipment. No matter, you know, if it's a MERV 7, MERV 8 filter, that is nothing and it's really not capturing um, these particles, which are, you know, 0.5 to 0.58 microns or, or something along those lines. It's just not uh, equipped with the type of filtration. It's also in many cases um, doesn't have the air change rates um, to do so. Um, what might be helpful and advisable is if we go back to this um, option seven slide, uh, what, uh, what we have talked through with um, with uh, someone who has past experience in evaluating infection control conditions uh, is an arrangement where you use uh, a weighted uh, and and whether if you have a, a existing uh, nurse, uh, I'm sorry, uh, existing privacy screen track, uh, and you can hang uh, a uh, visqueen barrier, a plastic barrier, uh, and then weight it at the bottom, then that may prove to be very helpful uh, from an arrangement standpoint. But if you can envision this, essentially you have a uh, isolation tent within the room. Now, uh, the this only works if you have a HEPA filtering uh, unit, uh, but in doing so, uh, you could essentially arrange it such that um, you could HEPA filter and recirculate the air uh, in that space and then the environmental heating and cooling, the environmental cooling by the fan coil unit could condition the air around that environment, uh, around that isolation tent that you're creating with an arrangement like this. Um, so we think that is 
uh, a workable solution if you are if if you simply have the circumstance that you have fan coal units and those are the only rooms that you can use, then that's probably the uh, best approach. Uh, beyond that, if there's n no other option than using the fan coal unit, uh, then what we would really strongly urge is that you figure out how to increase the room exhaust out of that space. And uh, that can come in a couple different ways, uh, similar to option, I think it was three uh, in the earlier slide, where you're typically, where you're just uh, putting some supplemental ex local exhaust in, whether that's, you know, take a fart fan, hang it and discharge it out the, uh, out, out the window um, or something along those lines, uh, that can be effective somewhat and at least creating more negative in a patient room. And, re and the more you're doing that, you're diluting and ensuring that uh, contaminants are being drawn away from the corridor, away from the patient, ultimately away from the space and the building. You want to make sure that any discharge to the exterior goes to a safe place. Uh, and then, or you could look at it from a potentially from a system level approach and uh, increase your toilet exhaust uh, airflow significantly. Um, there may be noise factors, there may be other factors. Uh, we would have you encourage that you look very closely at that because the potential exists that now you're pulling contaminants uh, away from the patient uh, or maybe not enough of them away from the patient so uh, and into the bathroom and then up and so there's a lot of other factors. Uh, consider how you can sanitize the fan coil units either between patients or and also ultimately whether that is a peroxide fog system or other decontam solutions or, or so forth. I don't know others I'm going to rely on for expertise in how you would deep decontam a fan coil unit after this event is over. Uh, I, I don't have a good opinion about that. I'm, I'm just uh, stating if you've got to deal with this, then you've got to deal with this and, and work with what you got. Um, one of our uh, systems has evaluated going to approach where they put a HEPA filter actually on the return grill. As you well know, from an air balance perspective, uh, a HEPA filter of any sort is gonna have a higher pressure drop. You put that on the return side, there's a lot more return air pressure. Some systems can handle that, some cannot. Um, also, if you do it in one uh, room, you kind of have to do it in every room. You can't, uh, because otherwise the imbalance of pressure uh, difference in return side is a lot different than on, a, on the supply side. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna work right if you don't do it everywhere. And that, that's both an expensive proposition and, and they also have to be you know, sealed as effectively as possible. So you know, this is option eight for a reason. It's not option one, two, or three. Uh, and then, you know, this is just an example of, of another location where, uh, where you're discharging from a HEPA system out, uh, out a window uh, by removing glass. And, and obviously, you have to deal with the environmental conditions associated with that. Um, if you are dedicating a unit, uh, we would encourage that it's very important to create a control vestibule. And then, uh, and then that's what this area here uh, in the big red block is defining. And uh, as you're doing that, you're also uh, creating uh, some notification that other entry points should not be used. And the intention is that you want to ensure that every person, material, everything that's flowing through that area is going through there in an orderly fashion in one place and treat it as such. Uh, I won't talk about this because you probably don't have airside economizer where you are, but here where there's no airside economizer, um, but if you wanted to take a system level approach, 
what we have seen, what we have uh, been helping other uh, facilities uh, to evaluate and consider and arrange is, and there's both physical issues with this as well as equipment uh, level issues and decisions with this, but uh, the uh, the the important things to note if you wanted to create a once through air system uh, with your existing system is you're cutting off your return, you're blocking off your return air to the air handler. Uh, and then with that, you have to create temporary air exhaust. And if you have a return air fan and maybe you can use that somehow at the air handler great if you don't then you need to get a piece of equipment perhaps a large exhaust fan and connect that to your return duct system you're accepting the fact that you may be putting some contaminant load into your return duct system and you need to deal with that later but today that's that's a, an approach and you would exhaust that air to somewhere safe outside uh, in order to make up all of the air going to the air handler, going into the air handler. Uh, what you're needing to do, what you're recognizing that you need to do is uh, either the air handler is sized, the coil is capable of handling 100% outside air, more than likely it is not. And so you have to do something, get other equipment in place perhaps to precondition the outside air, either to, the, uh, to a level that's similar to the return air conditions or all the way uh, to, uh, to greater level conditions so that the coil at the air handler is not seeing or experiencing any more load than it was typically designed to support. Uh, this has been done uh, with either temporary air handlers uh, that are on a roof or next to, on a building next to uh, with uh, temporary ducting to the um, to the air handler it probably won't be just to the outside air louver because remember the outside air louver is likely going to be 20 percent of your total airflow of the air handler uh, and not 100 percent of the airflow of the air handler and you're not going to cram it in there um, by just blowing it harder uh, and then uh, and then just the ability to, to meet that load, whether it's your chill water system or a temporary DX system in order to make that happen. Uh, what some facilities have evaluated and, and um, sometimes done is lower your chill water temperature so that um, you can increase your humidity uh, removal, your, your um, your latent removal capability of the system and of the overall system to offset what may, may be issue and capacity. There is a energy consequence to that, but um, these are extraordinary conditions we're all dealing with. Uh, we talked a little bit about the emergency department. Uh, I would only uh, additionally add that uh, a number of facilities are creating somewhat like uh, two different uh, treatment areas, one dedicated to ambulatory patients. You may still have uh, a patient that has a heart attack, a patient that um, gets shot, or um, sorry, that's a um, perhaps US-based uh, description, but, uh, but, but you may still have regular trauma cases of ambulatory patients, and you need an area to deal with that. And then you'll have another area that deals with respiratory cases and the likelihood of those patients um, being suspected or actual um, COVID patients. Uh, how are you set up for using UV or peroxide disinfectant systems for turning over those room, for any of these rooms? Uh, and then also from a standpoint of whether it's evaluating your air system or other measures like the measures that we described above, uh, similar to patient rooms, but can you convert uh, on the anticipation that maybe uh, like uh, here in the US in many areas, people are uh, you know, not going anywhere. 
So the, there's maybe less ambulatory patients, there's less trauma care needed. Uh, can you commit a trauma room to use as additional bays for uh, multiple patients that are uh, suspected or, or something along those lines? And then uh, some emergency departments have actually take, taken the uh, more intensive step of converting their air handler to temporary once through air system so that uh, for greater protection of their healthcare workers um, and the environment. Um, and then have, uh, as we talked about earlier, have a contingency, a fallback plan. How do you keep folks out of the ED? Um, this is just a reminder, this is the CDC air change clearance rate chart. Uh, a lot of patient rooms are four air changes or six air changes for 99% removal. That's 45 minutes to an hour that you need to give in order to um, then allow workers to come into that space, terminal clean the space, and, and, and go from there. A uh, couple last uh, items uh, that we would uh, make sure that you're thinking of. Oxygen therapy requires uh, that you have enough oxygen in hand. Um, that includes both uh, your bulk oxygen system and then also includes things like the small portable cylinders, portable oxygen cylinders as you might transport patients or as may be needed in certain circumstances where you don't have a piped oxygen system to everywhere. Uh, uh, and then all the other accoutrements, uh, masks, humidifiers, uh, O2 hoses, and so forth. Um, we are hearing cases of significantly greater numbers of patients needing to move to ECMO care, and that is a whole uh, level of clinical description I won't even get into, but it's a, uh, a very specialized level of care with specialized equipment um, and sometimes even specialized spaces. Uh, I would just simply warn that, that that's an item and um, it is what it is. Uh, make sure you've tested your emergency generator system. Um, the last thing you want to have happen is uh, any hiccup in um, the normal power serving all this stuff and not being able to um, continue the, the arrangements that you have set up in this uh, critical, uh, critical time. Uh, work with your local authorities. Make sure to document what you're doing. Uh, you know, it's important to document it. It's important to still maintain uh, the life safety arrangements. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, don't short, uh, short change that stuff. And then have a plan in place. Consider uh, when we hopefully sometime go back to a normal uh, situation, what you would need to do to disinfect all of the things that have been touched and dealt with. Um, we're all working on a mindset toward flattening the curve. Um, you may or may not have heard the expression. Uh, on, the good news would be that it wouldn't overwhelm the healthcare system that you have, that we have. Uh, the bad news, if you will, is that it means a longer time period that, that all of this exists under. Um, in places where uh, hurricanes and, and the likelihood that this would extend into hurricane season, anything you're doing today also needs to factor in how are you tying it down, how are you protecting it, how is it um, not compromising your hurricane plan issues. Uh, I, you know, there are people who uh, uh, may spread this unintentionally and um, and uh, so recognize and everyone needs to think of themselves as much as uh, as that they're walking around with it because the the matter of being non-symptomatic doesn't mean you don't have it uh, or that it's not affecting you as it would potentially someone other than you. Uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, just a couple quick notes. One is uh, we've uh, from uh, someone that we know, they've said silicone half masks with N95 filters are a great reusable item. 
and we should encourage that. And I, we would also say in some cases, facilities, uh, HVAC staff um, may need to be going in and out of those environments, taking care of this equipment, arranging this equipment, all of that stuff. Um, they need protection as well. Uh, and then also when you're reusing gear, uh, it may be best advised to double glove. And I don't know uh, what that means, but it has to do with um, just simply um, how you're handling the gear that you're handling and protecting yourself in the meanwhile. Uh, this is the, the um, spread as it's occurring in uh, the US. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the case load uh, has kept jumping up day by day. And so uh, where you are, we uh, can certainly imagine that um, you may experience the same. So we um, certainly wish you uh, uh, well and safe and um, practice uh, as, as well advised the practices that have been circulated about safe distancing and uh, hand washing and um, hunkering down, which is our term for just staying home for, you know, uh, to reduce the spread and, and do what you do, do what you can. Uh, we hope this has been um, helpful for you. If you do have any questions, if something comes up uh, and you need in any way um, um, any additional uh, information, certainly feel free to reach out. Uh, we would certainly encourage that you look at the ASHRAE website. It has additional information uh, and a dedicated uh, front page, I believe. Um, the same goes for ASHE. There's a lot of really good information in the American Society for Healthcare Engineers. Uh, unfortunately, some of it is uh, for members um, only, but if you know someone who is, certainly reach out to them as well. Um, I thank you so much, and uh, we wish you all the best. So thank you, Michael. It was quite an interesting and intense uh, presentation. Uh, from the Ashray Caricom point of view, we must say thank you for taking the time today to give us this presentation and to also share with the wider uh, Caricom region this information. Um, you guys can look forward to Michael doing another presentation um, along these same lines on our seminar series on coronavirus and your indoor air quality. Um, so you can look forward to that. You can check out our page at Ashray Caricom and you can scan the barcode or go to Eventbrite and type in coronavirus and your indoor air quality and register to be part of this uh, webinar series. Um, so once again, Michael, thanks a lot and we will be in touch. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael.